Thanks very much. I'm hoping the preamble's here somewhere. We've got one here. I'm just going to read the preamble of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees to AA membership. We are self-supporting for our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thank you. Now, I just need to let you know, everybody, that I am dyslexic. I think he's done the fire thing, isn't he? So if I get things wrong and I pray to dog, there you go. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, oh, I'm giving up with that lot. It's, um, <laughs> We've got three lovely speakers, as you can see. Uh, we've got um, Joe from Sheffield. No. Pat, Pat from um, Dublin. And Andrea, originally from Springburn, but now from Bethnal Green in London. So without further ado, I'm going to invite... Oh, see, I've oh, got dyslexia, see? <laughs> Can we now um, observe Tradition 7? Thank you. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, hello everyone. So I deliberately missed the pot, so the committee will pull me up to let you know I'm not perfect. So, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to hand over to... um, Joe, who's from Sheffield, she's got a few friends here. Can we hear from them? Very good, so over to you, Joe. Thanks, Harry. Um, my name's Joe and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Joe. God, you look amazing from up here. Um, that countdown was fantastic. Um, it's just an absolute privilege to be asked to speak here um, it's kind of blown me away really um, I I come from Sheffield, my home group is Saturday morning, um, half past ten at the cathedral in Sheffield, best meeting in the world, um, no offence to anybody else but if you're ever that way please come and visit us um, it was my second meeting um, just over six years ago and um, became my home group very very quickly after that um, but a bit about how I got there um, I kind of, um, I, brought, I was brought up in Stafford. Um, I'd got a fantastic mom, a sister, um, my dad. I can't remember a lot about my childhood years at all. My, my, I've blocked a lot out of, um, of my mind. And that kind of comes back as, as, um, as I believe God's ready to let me handle it. Um, um, but I do remember a few things. I remember my mum telling me that my dad started having affairs when she was pregnant with me. Um, and how my mind works is that I take a statement that you know that that's you know can can be taken in many ways and take it that therefore it was all my fault you know I shouldn't have been born um, all that sort of stuff you know so so my head kind of goes off on tangents with things um, and my dad kind of he'd left when I was about five and we used to see him every other weekend and and um, and then at around the age of ten we didn't see him anymore um, and. I can't remember really what happened then, but I remember after that I kind of, um, I started to go off the rails. I I didn't really know, looking back with hindsight, which all of this is, because I I was just there at the time doing doing whatever I was doing, you know. But looking back, I I kind of had no way to deal with how I was feeling about about that situation. Um, I shaved all my hair off. Um, I wore fluorescent socks to PE, which wasn't allowed, Um, you know. I, I, um, I tried. I really wanted to be a lesbian because, like, that was, you know, then I was going to be different, you know. And, and I sort of tried to rebel in all sorts of ways to, to find a way to, to deal with how I was feeling. And, and, um, and none of it really worked, you know. I, I was vegetarian. I wore boys' clothes, you know. I, I sort of, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't express what I was feeling, and, and I couldn't deal with it. And. Um, 
And, and I remember when I was 13, I went to Doxy Youth Club and we bought, me and my, a few of my friends bought some cans of lager and we put some paracetamol in it because we heard that that made you get drunk quicker. Um, but, but everybody else was sort of happy with like eight cans of lager between six of us, I think it was. Um, but I bought a half bottle of vodka. Um, and the, the shopkeeper just said, oh, just keep it hidden and out of the way, you know. And, um, and nobody else drank any of that. And as soon as I started, that was it. The, on, the, only, the only reason I stopped drinking that was because somebody, a friend of mine smashed the bottle, you know. And I ended up in hospital. And that was my, that was my first drink, you know. Um, it didn't go really very well, you know. Um, but, but I do remember that everything went away, you know, all that, all that anger and the confusion and the fear and all that, I, you know, I, it went away. And, um, and that was what I liked about booze. I remember being stood in court a few months later um, because the guy who sold me the vodka got, got put up in court. And I remember the judge um, saying, Joanna, what do you think of vodka? And I just I stood there, I was like, oh, it's all right, isn't it? You know? <laughs> And my mum just, I could see, you know, she was like, she's just like her father. My, my dad was an alcoholic, you know, and, and uh, my sister remembers how finding the vodka bottles and things like that. As I say, I don't remember a lot, but, um, and it, and it kind of just carried on from there, really. I, you know, I, I'd, I'd sort of got in with the wrong crowd. I, I'd, I'd be there, you know, doing the things I wasn't supposed to be doing down at the sheds and burning them down. And, you know, and I always got away with it. You know, I always got away with it. And, uh, and I, I just kind of, I just kind of carried on like that. And, and my, my drinking story is very, very dull, really. You know, it didn't matter. You know, it, it, it always ended up the same way. Every time I started drinking, I'd end up drunk, you know. And, um, and that sort of took me through, you know, work and then college. College was fantastic because, you know, that was what you did at college. You know, you went out, you got drunk. That's what everybody did. You know, but I remember doing 36 nights in a row and being really proud of that, you know. And I remember, like, going to the, um, going to the uh, cocktail night and there was 12 on the menu and I sort of threw up after eight and then carried on with the rest of it so I could get the free one at the end, you know. And, and it, it, was, it was never really normal. But, but at college, I, you know, I, I didn't really have a crew. I didn't have a crowd that I was with. I'd flit among everybody and, and you know, and and sleep with men to get them to like me you know and 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 sort of all the all the things i did were were just to, just to to get people to to like me to want to be with me you know to to sort of say that i was worth something you know and 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 i and i carried on like that throughout my life really and whenever it got bad because my it, it went in waves for me my drinking would get worse i would change something so i'd dump the man or whatever and it'd get better for a bit and then it'd go worse again you know and each time it went worse it went further down further down further down and i tried various things i tried changing jobs i tried you know moving to different places um different fellas because it was obviously all his fault you know I need to be single I'll do that for a bit and then I'll be okay you know and I just need my freedom you know I had a year and a half where I, I left work and, and went around the world and and you know and I can't really remember most of it you know it was a little bit of a blur it was all kind of a waste you know um I, I took six months towards the end of, of my drinking I, I took a six months to sabbatical and I went to Africa because I thought well if I can go and help other people and if I can go somewhere where they've got nothing, then I can't possibly justify drinking or smoking. And within three days, I was back on it, you know, because it was really, really cheap, you know. And, um, and, and you know, I, I really don't think I should have survived Africa. A um, lot of things happened there. I, I, I got, you know, got robbed and attacked and... and um, and there were a lot of bad things that happened and my drinking really escalated. I, um, I found myself in a relationship with this African man and, and he was a spiritual worker. And it's um, quite an important part of my story because, because it was the first time that I saw or felt things that I couldn't explain. There was no logical explanation for what was happening. And I remember being really quite intrigued by that. Um, and I remember as well, we went to lots of spiritual workers and, and they said that I'd been cursed and it was a curse that had been passed down from my dad um, to his favourite daughter and that was alcohol. 
and these were people who'd never met me before in my life you know and 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 you know I believe they were right that was how they believed it you know and and they did lots of work to try and to try and cure me of it um and they said you know do you believe what we're going to do and I'm like yeah yeah I didn't I didn't you know and and I kind of believed that work but but not in not in my time you know and um and I, I remember, well, I don't remember, when I, when I got back from Africa, I saw my mum and, um, and my mum said to me, I had to resign myself to the fact you were dead because she phoned us up drunk from the middle of Africa telling us you were going to marry this African man and then you disappeared for three weeks and we didn't hear from you. You know, she said, she said, I just thought you were dead. And that's what I had to resign myself to. You know, that, that, that's the kind of harms I did to other people. You know, I, I tossed away relationships. I had no regard for anybody else. You know, it was all about me, all about me. What, what do I want? If you had my life, poor me, my dad left me, you know, all this, all this stuff. And it, and it was all about me. And, um, and and I came back, and again, I got back. It'll be different now. It'll be different. Now I'll, now I'll be able to fresh start, you know, again. And, um, and it, nothing ever changed. It was just Groundhog Day, you know. The, a lot of the last time I'd drink in, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go, I'm, I, I don't want to do that again. You know, I'd check my phone, who have I phoned? I'd look at Facebook, you know, whatever it was, and, and try and piece together the night before, phone people up and sort of try and glean from what they said, what had actually happened, and, and try and dismiss it. And, um, and, you know, I would wake up with that, with just the horseman there, you know, and, and, and by one o'clock, I was drinking, I, was, I planned to go for a drink again, you know. It, it lasted so little time, you know, I would forget again, it, you know, and all of a sudden it wasn't that bad. And, um, and, I, and I, when I first came here and, 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 and it was explained about the mental obsession, I, I kind of understood that because at, at one, two o'clock I'd change my mind and know I'd be going for a drink and that was when I felt the relief. I was like, oh, it'll be all right now. I didn't even need to drink it, you know. It wasn't when I got it, it was when I knew I was gonna get it, you know, and, um, and that was my relief. And, um, and it, it took me to a place where um, my last drunk, I was with two, two friends who were really, really dear to me. And um, I had no idea what happened that night, but the next morning I woke up and everybody was screaming and I didn't know what was going on. And, um, and the, the thing that, the thing that I think, I don't, I don't, I, that had happened many times. Many times I'd woken up and gone, I'm not going to do it, you know, but this time was different. I, um, I didn't know what I was capable of anymore. It was like all the, all the boundaries had gone. You know, these were two people who were completely dear to me and I didn't know what I'd done to them. And that was a level further than I'd sunk to before. You know, a lot of my unacceptables had become acceptable over time and this had just gone one stage further and that morning I remember breaking down and, and saying I, you know I can't do this anymore and that's the bit I remember when when we have a moment, moment silence at the beginning of the meeting because my first sponsor said to me never forget that moment that moment if you forget that you'll be drunk again you know and um and and I, I just I just remember completely breaking down I didn't speak to a god or anything like that I just said I cannot do this anymore and something at that point changed and I cannot tell you what that is I have no explanation for that whatsoever something changed and um and I went to a friend's and, and I, I managed to not drink for the next three weeks. But the only way I could do that was to lock myself in my house and clean. <laughs> my house has never been so clean. I cleaned lampshades. I cleaned like picture rails. It was like I had to keep busy, you know. And, um, and, and again, with the mental obsession, I, I, once I got here, I could understand that because that three weeks was absolute torture. It was constant. You could just have one. Well, you can never have one. You could just have a shandy. Yeah, but you've never had a shandy before, you know. You, you're just lonely. You just need people, you know. And do, 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 do. Just constant, absolute constant. And, um, and I, that was what I couldn't stand, you know. And uh, so I ended up at an AMA meeting after, after three weeks of that. And uh, I hid around the corner because I was a bit scared of all the tramps, you know. And, uh, and that typical, that typical, you know, idea of what an alcoholic was. I got no idea what an alcoholic was. I remember my boss said to me, you can't be an alcoholic because you don't have vodka on your cornflakes. That kept me drinking for at least another year, you know. Um, because I thought you had to drink spirits 24-7 to be an alky, you know. And, um, 
And what, what I found when I walked in that room was absolute love. Um, that's what I remember. There was a lady, Alison, and she just greeted me with this absolutely fantastic smile. And she just said, come in, you know. And I, I don't remember much about that meeting, but I do remember completely identifying what, what people were talking about. And it was the first time, I'd re I, for, for the first time I realised I wasn't my, on my own. Because I thought, no, I thought you lot, everybody had life sorted. You know, I was, I was always looking for that missing piece that I thought everybody else had got and they could do life and I couldn't. And, um, and, I, and I kind of, I arrived in this place where other people talked about feeling like I did and doing what I'd done and, and not being able to stop. And, 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 and they said, you know, we've, we've got a solution. And I'm like, wow. And there were some people in that room, not everybody in that room, but some people in that room who had that like ready black glow around them. And I thought, I don't know what that is, but I want it, you know? And um, I was hooked, absolutely hooked, because I was desperate, I was absolutely desperate. I got no other choices, I got no other options. And um, so I went to my second meeting, which is now my home group. And somebody said to me, that's your most important, because you came back. And, um, and I listened and I got told I was going for a coffee. A group of very strong women told me I was going for coffee. They didn't ask me, they told me. And I'm so grateful for that because I had no idea, you know, and, and I needed to be told. And um, that was the beginning of, of, um, of, of a completely different life, really. Um, I didn't realize how poorly I was. Um, my first, I got a sponsor at my third meeting while some guy was trying to get my phone number. Um, some, somebody dragged me out of the way and started to explain to me about the 13th step. And I said, what's the other 12s? <laughs> no idea, you know. And, um, and I just said, will you sponsor me? And I got no idea what that meant either. And she said, yeah. And I went, ace, what do we do? And she was like, start reading that. Read black, black bits, leave white bits alone. And... Um, and, uh, and, th and that was the beginning. The first journey through the steps was, it was exactly what it was meant to be, but I can't remember much about it to, to now, to be honest. You know, I, I, um, I I'd kind of struggled a little bit with God. Appendix two set me free on that, you know, um, and, and I realized, you know, it didn't have to be a blinding flash of light. And, and looking back in hindsight, it actually probably was, but I couldn't see it at the time, you know, and, um, and powerlessness was absolutely, I, I was completely convinced of that. I, I just looked back, I found me in the book. I looked back at my, my life and found me in, in, in every page of the book, you know. And, um, and, and so I went through my first journey. I was very grateful for step five because step four I could only get so far, you know, in complete denial about what I'd done and what my part in it was, you know. And, and thank God for somebody else to be able to show me, show me the truth and help me to see it in a kind and loving way, not in a, not in a nasty, harsh way, you know. And, um, and I started to make amends, but God didn't reveal many people to me at the time and I, and I didn't realise until my sort of second journey through the steps how much you've got to change before amends me actually mean anything, you know, that word sorry doesn't cut it, you know, I've got to not be doing those things anymore to be making proper amends to people, you know, and, um, and I started on a journey of trying to find whatever this God thing is, you know, and I, I had no idea really what God is except it's not me. Um, I, f I think God speaks to me through people and music and and um, and books and all sorts of ways, really. Um, but my my second journey through the steps, my my my, my relationship with my first sponsor broke down, and, and that was one of the hardest things I had to deal with because that was the first real relationship I'd had with a, with another human being, and it was really hard, and it knocked me. Um, and I'd written a step four about her and not shared it with anybody because who do you go to when you've got a problem with your sponsor? Um, and I was very lost for quite a few months, but eventually I got in enough pain and, and did something about it, you know, and, um, and again, had to see my part in it. Um, and, and I procrastinated about my second step four. Um, I've had many beautiful things happen to me in sobriety. I was about a year sober and they said, don't make any big decisions in the first couple of years. So I quit my job and worked for an American company. Went to America three times, um, went to Bali. And I was actually in Bali at this conference. Turned out I wasn't supposed to be there and I got kicked out by the management of this conference. And I was in complete and utter fear in a hotel room in Bali. I've never been 
wasn't so scared. I was ordering room service because I didn't want to go anywhere near the bar. And I opened my big book and it said, God either is or he isn't. And I thought, what would I do if I was at home? And I thought, phone the helpline. You know, phone, phone something. And I, so I phoned the helpline. I was at meeting the next morning. And, uh, and they said to me, are you here for the annual barley roundup? I says, no, what's that? This is there's about 600 people coming here for a convention this weekend. I was like absolutely blown away. And um, I got a very stern talking to off a guy called Bangkok John, who was 36 years sober. And I spent the next four days writing me set four. Um, and it was fearless and, and thorough. And, um, and you know, I, I was very, very grateful for that. There's, like I say, there's been many things that have happened. And, and not long after that, and getting honest with my new sponsor, um, I was about two and a half years sober, my house flooded. Um, it was, I was thinking about redecorating. This is out, this, it's got a great sense of humour, God. Um, I was thinking, oh, maybe I need to decide what I like and, and maybe what I, I need to do in my home, you know. And, uh, and he sent me this flood. Um, <laughs> it was quite biblical. It was like four days of hot water pumping out of, a, you know, the back of my washing machine and whole house flooded and steamed. I had to move out for nine months. It had, the whole thing had to be redecorated. I was like, yeah, okay. Now I need to make some decisions, you know. Um, but in that time as well, I'd, I'd, I'd decided to leave the job I'd gone to. I'd done everything I could to make it work and, and chosen to leave and have a little bit of a break. And then uh, my dad died. You know, unfortunately, I don't have one of those lovely stories with my dad where it all reconciled and everything was happy and rosy. You know, we didn't reconcile. Um, uh, I, I had no, I've no idea to this day what was going on in his head. Um, he just died. Um, but fortunately, through that second step four, I'd done a lot, a lot of looking at that, you know, and a lot of, um, a lot of beginning to accept that actually that was his choice, and 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 he was quite within his rights to to make that choice, and and maybe his decisions weren't the best, but he did the best he could, you know, and um, and so you know that was it was a really it was a really tough time, but the best the best bit about that really, I got into my first relationship, wasn't a relationship except in here, um, and uh, and and I realised two and a half years sober. I was doing exactly the same behaviours as before, two and a half years away from a drink. I finally realised that alcohol wasn't the problem. I was, you know, and it was a, it was a different level of understanding my alcoholism, you know, and um, and you know, and I, I I was doing 12 meetings a week. I was I was running around like a nutter after newcomers, um, you know. I was just doing exactly what I needed to do to stay sober, and it was fantastic, um, and. Uh, and, it, uh, and it's just carried on from there, really. I just want to share a bit about where I am today. I, I shared in Torrey a few weeks ago, and I kind of thought, you know, I shared a lot about early days and everything. And, and actually, I was in a really bad place a few weeks ago. And, um, and, I, and I didn't even realize I'd kind of got there. Um, I'd, my sponsor had said something to me, and I'd not, you know, in a, in a normal relationship, you have to actually say to somebody, no, I don't agree with that, or what do you mean about that? And I'd not. And I'd taken this tiny little thing and blown it out of all proportion, and I didn't realise how, how poorly I was getting. And, um, and we got back, and, and I went to my sponsors, and I went to her with a step four that was all about her. And I said, I'm really sorry, but this is all about you. It's not about you. It's about me. Because step four, thank God, it's as fancied or real. Because I had to get out what was in here. Not necessarily the reality of what had happened, but how I was feeling about what had happened. And, and I realized how much I'd been shutting down and not talking about stuff. And, you know, that's the important stuff. It's what am I doing with my sobriety today? I've been through some amazing things. I've done some fantastic stuff, but what am I doing today? Because that's important. So I've started talking again. I've started getting honest about that. I came here, I shared at Lockerbie, and I got honest about it again, you know. And, and that's the stuff that I need to keep pushing. That's the stuff I need to keep doing, you know, because that's what's going to keep me well today because I've only got today, you know, and, and I can't rest on yesterday's recovery. And so... In, in the process of that, what I've realised is how my dad took a very little thing and blew it all out of proportion into, I'm never going to see you again, you know, because he was an alcoholic and he's got the same head as me. And it's given me, again, another understanding of, 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 of this disease at a deeper level. But I can't rush any of this. I'm six. I'm a babby. There's so many old people in here. I'm like, this is so cool. Um, but, but I am where I am and I've got what I've got. And, and you lot show me that if I just keep going, then everything will be all right. I can get through anything you know and I don't need to take a drink and um, it's an absolute honor and privilege and I can't do any of this with
without all of you because we do this I don't do my recovery we do it and, and, and I want to thank each and every one of you for the part you've played in it whether it be big or small or you know about it or you don't so thanks ever so much Thanks very much, Joe. That was, um I had a friend that used to come to this gathering every year and he was, he was like Marmite. You either loved him or hate him. Terry from Berry, And he's, he's poorly at the moment. And uh, you mentioned about um, forgetting where you come from. A few moments silence. And he always used to say to me, Are He said, when we have the few moments silence, that's when the spirituality enters the room. And um, I think he was right for me. So our next speaker is Patrick from Dublin. Over to you, Patrick. Hi, my name is Pat and I'm an alcoholic. So this, this very moment just right now is, is the, the pinnacle or the, the highest point of my alcoholic career to date. <laughs> to be standing in front of so many of my friends and um, fellow alcoholics. Um, there was a lovely lady that talked to us before we came out sort of just to tell us the format at the meeting and uh, Betty, is it Betty? And uh, she said, yeah, go on guys, you're doing God's work. So, um, so I think I'll just try and be honest and let God do his own thing, if, if that's okay. And um, yeah, I, I, like everybody else, I have a story, um, and it, of a story of recovery and uh, plenty of reasons why I might have become alcoholic. Or, I like to think of the more of the reasons that shape me and still shape me today, you know, and cause me the most difficulties and um, make it difficult for me to be the person that I really want to be. Um, and um, like a lot of people are here, I childhood, you know, big, big hassle in the castle. Um, my dad left when I was fairly young, about seven, and um, mother didn't deal with that really too well. And she turned to uh, legal drugs, I suppose they were back then in the 50s and uh, 60s. And, um, you know, and it was pretty, pretty grim. And, uh, you know, that's the way it was. And I just identify with constantly having this sense of shame you know, that we didn't have much and we didn't have what everybody else had. And previous, we had sort of a nice home and we were in a sort of a nice area and we just sort of like, it was like a, a sitcom or something. We were, we were the house in the middle of nice houses that fell apart, you know, and to the, light, to the left it was lovely, to the right it was lovely, and in the middle was us. And um, it was like, you know, a, a friend of mine uh, was driving by, my brother, a friend of my brother's was driving by in the opposite side of the street one time. My brother says, I live over there. And he said, is that the front of it or the back of it? And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, we didn't have, we didn't do painting or nothing. Nothing got done for years and years. And, and I just remember this sense of, um, you know, really not, uh, not being good enough. You know, that's, that's the best way I can describe it. And I suppose if your dad leaves and you love your dad, and, uh, and he leaves when you're about seven. You know, it doesn't really, you know, it gives you that sense of you're not loved, you're not wanted. Um, you know, although I bury that in some place with a lot of other stuff, uh, and even for a long time I used to, you know, sniff the pillows and sniff this coat still in the wardrobe and stuff like that. Um, but a part of me pushed that hurt down somewhere that I thought I'd never have to deal with it. And, um, and then the stuff that went on in the house about, you know, you're not good enough and you're just that way, way. You know, there was a lot of stuff. And I could identify my friend Brendan today. Like, I was basically a good kid, but I was really, you know, like hurting inside. And uh, I was acting out for a lot of the stuff that happened. So, like a lot of people, alcohol was seemed like a really good proposition. I heard someone saying one time um, that they thought life was a type of an apprenticeship. You know, it was miserable. Your childhood was miserable until you discovered alcohol. And that's it, then you're done. You know, you're qualified. And from now on, life will be great. And it was like that for me. I, I thought I had arrived. 
You know, I found something that killed that sense of inadequacy and something that killed the pain of just trying to fit in, you know. The biggest thing was, was for me was fitting in. There's a friend of mine says that the opposite to addiction is not uh, sobriety, it's connection. And because, um, like, you know, that's as an alcoholic, I felt the loneliness of not fitting in. And, um, and the only way that I could do that in my scheme as a child, anyway, I developed this sort of idea in my head that uh, I could pretend to be somebody else. You know, and I could make you like me or love me even uh, if I put on this, this per- be, become this person that I think you would accept. And I did that for years. I was fake, phony, false. And, uh, but the underlying sort of thing that was going on for me was I just wasn't good enough. And if you really knew me and you could really see inside of me, you wouldn't want me. And uh, you wouldn't want to be around me and you wouldn't accept me and you wouldn't love me. And uh, so I went through life really like that, uh, trying to please people. And, you know, I was afraid of conflict because, you know, conflict made me vulnerable. Con- conflict was like somebody sort of finding you out, you know. It wasn't the situation that you got into conflict over was the problem. It was like the hidden part to me. When somebody was conflict, uh, con- uh, in conflict with me, I'd feel that they could see me. And um, so it was difficult, and I drank, and I drank, you know, when we used to drink, we started drinking with friends, young kids, teenagers at the time, and we'd do that at the weekend. And it wasn't really all that long since, and I wanted to do it on a Monday, you know, which was, you know, that was, and I wanted to do it then on a Tuesday, and I wanted to do it on a Wednesday. And it just became more important to me than the rest of them. And, and I've seen guys who buy, you know, we'd buy drink and the off license, slaggings of cider, and, you know, and I, I always had this sense of that I clutched mine tightly. You know, people threw theirs away if they were sick or they couldn't finish it. But to me, it was just like it meant more than just alcohol. And it meant more than just that buzz on that night. But it was making me, it was allowing me to, to, to be alive. That's the way I felt. Um, I heard someone say they felt they were born about six points below normal. And I, I sort of identify with that, you know. If, if I was going out somewhere um, for the evening and if the arrangements was to meet at eight, you know, I needed to be there at seven because those five or six drinks before would just get me up on a par, you know. And then I would go on to get blotto uh, constantly. and. Uh, but that, you know, that went on, and um, I'm cross-addicted, so then I, I turned to other substances, and that got very messy. Um, you know, and, and I, I eventually went to England, and I lived in London for a long time. Started out okay for a short time, and it was like the geographical at 17, but it wasn't very long till I found the people who were like me. You know, the messed up, screwed up folks. Like, I could sense them anywhere. <laughs> Any, anywhere I go, I could find out where they were. Even if I didn't know my way around, I would just, it was just like an instinct, you know, where the losers hung out, you know. <laughs> and uh, I ended up down in Piccadilly and down, you know, around these places. And um, like, I'm only 17 and I haven't got a clue, but I just knew this is where I belong. Um, and uh, and that got you know that got worse and worse and worse, and after after a period of time, you know I think I had probably about eighteen nineteen years of age. I was walking the streets, you know, and I used to sort of wonder, you know, how this had happened to me, you know, how did I get from a kid that I remember I lived you know out in the country, but there was a lot of green area around where I lived, and I played in trees and walked in fields and played football and. You know, I remember, you know, something of a childhood, even though it was a difficult one. But and here I am, I'm I'm in a strange city uh, and I'm messed up and I've nowhere to live. And um, and it's just this sense of isolation. And it was just, you know, there's a part of me. It was like, um, you know, the black sheep thing, you know, it was like I'd gone too far to come back. You know, I felt I should just write my life off and I hadn't had my 24 spare to yet. So that, you know, that was it. I, I remember I've often heard me, people have heard me share, but in London in the 70s, they were, uh, they had these basement apartments and um, you could see into the apartments as you look down by the railings, you know, as you walk by, you'd look down into the basement and there was, it was a fashion at the time that these velvet curtains, everybody had velvet curtains and, uh, 
Yeah. And uh, I used to wonder what it was like behind these red velvet curtains. You know, what it was like to be sitting in and maybe getting a baby ready for bed, you know, to be belong to somebody, maybe having a kiss and a cuddle or watching the movie or sending out for a takeaway. You know, I used to just wonder what it was like. I'd be going to sleep in some derelict house somewhere and, uh, and I just wondered what it was like to belong, to be part of something and to be part of somebody. And, um, and that was the sort of sense of isolation and just desperation that the, the disease took me to. And, you know, I, would, I couldn't sleep at night, so I'd wake up in the morning and again, everybody seemed to have a sense of purpose. You know, they'd be going on trains and cars and tubes and vans and bicycles with their lunchbox, their briefcase, their toolbox, whatever. And everybody was going somewhere and had something to do. And I would just be lost. You know, I had nothing. And, um, and that, you know, went on for a while and I tried to, you know, live like that. And, you know, when you're an alcoholic and an addict, like you, you really only have one priority. And once, once I could meet that priority every day, like I could get through that day. And then there came a time, I described that to a counsellor one time. He said, so your, your problem was manageable because you could get what you needed every day. All your eggs are in one basket. And I said, yeah. And he said, why are you here now? And... Uh, I didn't know what he meant, but eventually he said, because your problem is now unmanageable. So even in that craziness, I managed. And, but then there came a time when I just had enough. And um, I tell that story. I lived in Kilburn at the time, and I really decided to, to end it all. And, uh, and I wasn't, you know, it wasn't a cry for help. I'd done all them. You know, I would take, you know, an overdose and I'd expect to be found and I'd expect, you know, a bit of attention and get to the hospital and nice people would talk to me and um, stuff like that and a bit of a rest and they feed me, maybe give me some money, social welfare. And, uh, and then there was the times like that night in Kilburn when I just wanted it finished because I couldn't see that tomorrow had anything left to offer. That it was, you know, my life was just, I had no life. And, um, and I planned it and I did it properly and I, I knew that there would be no coming back. And, and i just share with you, but I, I remember taking what I took and again, I knew what to take and I knew what it would do. And um, within a minute, the room started to go dark and I had to lie down on the bed. And I remember, you know, just thinking, these are my last thoughts. This is it. This is my last thoughts. In this damp room, in this squat in London, uh, this is my life is going to end. And, uh, and I just remember lying there thinking that, these are it, this is it. And as it happens, talking about God's work, but the people who lived in the house had gone off to a party and the young lady forgot her handbag. And um, she decided that uh, to go back for it, probably because she thought I'd rob it. Um, but <laughs> so she came back and they found me and... Um, and that was it, yet another hospital and another emergency unit, another pumped out and uh, another long spell in hospital. And, uh, but I survived. And, um, you know, the funny thing was, um, I remember being in the hospital, Harrow Road, and uh, they had to barrier nurse me in this room because I was so sick. Um, and it wasn't that I'd give anybody anything, it was anybody could give anything to me. And um, people had to come in with gloves and hats and plastic bags on their shoes and gowns and masks. And that did an awful lot for my self-esteem. But uh, it was like the space invaders coming in to give me my, the breakfast. You know? But um, I remember there was a nurse uh, there. She was a nun, in fact. And uh, she uh, used to nurse me and she was really lovely and she was nice to me. And she came in one day and she said, you know, I won't be seeing you anymore, Pat, because I'm going to Africa. I'm going back to Africa, to the missions where I had been previously, she'd been previously. And I said, oh, that's, you know, that's sad. Uh, I liked her. And she said, you know, would you like to come with me? And I had said, to where? She said, to Africa. And I said, for what? <laughs> and she said, well, I've already discussed it with the order and we would pay your fare, bring you out there and you'd help us in the mission, stay there for a few years and then you know, we'd bring you back. Now, I didn't understand, you know, that she saw someone who was dying and she decided to offer them a bit of con a kindness. I understood the kindness. I didn't understand what she was trying to, to achieve. 
And I had a few moments like that in my life, and I've always sort of shared that this is what AA is so important, but it's moments of kindness when people reach out to you when you're at your lowest that really, they're like invitations for you to come back. They're like little beacons that sort of say, you know, there is people out there, there is decent people out there, there is a better world out there, and if you work hard enough, you can come back to it, you know? So that's the way my life was. Um, fast forward a lot of years, I made it back home to Ireland, um, survived all of that craziness, uh, made it back home to Ireland and got married, uh, had our first child, stopped one addiction and then the other one, the main one, my alcoholic, uh, took over. And um, it was really, you know, replacing one thing with the other, but it just took on a different shape. Um, now it was messy. I was drinking constantly. Um, the depression had taken over, and, um, and I just wanted, you know, I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't get anything together and so on. And, um, you know, we had this little child, and, um, you know, but there was a part of me, when she came along first, there was a part of me that just wanted something more. That's all I can sort of say. It was, it was like as if I didn't care about myself because of my low self-esteem, and I really didn't care what happened to me. I didn't expect to really survive, but I cared what happened to her. And I saw her in this little uh, cot, and uh, just a part of me just sort of wanted to find a way to stop. I wanted to find a way to, to, to be somebody else, to be somebody better for her, uh, if, if, if nothing else. And... Um, and I, I did, you know, I tried, I made a few phone calls and I hemmed and hawed about treatment centres and this, that and the other. And in the end, I knew a friend who was pretty similar to me in the way he lived his life and, and he had gone to AA and he was a couple of years sober. And um, now I wouldn't put a lot of value on this. This guy was crazy. And uh, he wasn't the type that you'd really reach out to if you needed help. But I said, I'll find out about these meetings. And uh, so I rang him and I uh, explained what was happening. And uh, he said, uh, I remember that day I was going to the pub, like later on. The pubs didn't open till a certain hour. And I was going to go about 12 o'clock. And I was talking to him for a while. And uh, I said, listen, I have to go now. <laughs> I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll go to that meeting the following Thursday. And he said to me, yeah, I'll, I'll quit tomorrow. And I said, what does that mean? He said, ah, it's just the same we have. So, um, so I didn't stop drinking that day, but I went to the meeting. And um, I can't say I was, you know, blown away. I can't say I was majorly enthusiastic. Um, but I knew something was going on in the room. Like, I never understood the disease, the disease I was suffering from. I never understood alcoholism until I heard people talk about it. And I never understood the concept of a higher power or what that, you know, what that was and what, that, what I needed in my life. So I started going to meetings and, you know, it got well. Things improved. Life improved. A lot of the things that I dreamed about... Um, you know, that I could never really, it was such a mess all my life, I never got anything together. But when I got into AA and I got sober, things started to come together. Started a little business, it was going okay. Um, more children came at four now at this stage, towards the end of, and um, then lo and behold, like 11 years into this journey, I decided to drink again. So I don't know, you know, I had, I had been pulled from the sea of alcoholism by, by, by AA, uh, saved from the shipwreck that I was, um, and, uh, you know, had got a good life, reared my kids, and so on. And I, just, I decided to jump overboard and back into the sea again uh, and wait nine years before another uh, rescue boat came along. And, uh, and it was horrendous, really. There was, there was nothing like um, having been sober and experienced a sober way of life than to be a drunk again and, uh, and to try and justify it. And in the earlier days I did, um, I tried to sort of say, oh, well, it's sort of working and it's not like what it was in the beginning. It was sort of a difference. Now I had a few bob, but now I had some money. Uh, I wasn't sort of penniless and uh, I could buy drink and it wasn't causing everybody hassle. But the same madness started taking over in my head. The same depression sort of just crept in. And I'd wake up in the morning and I'd open my eyes. And the first thing, I'd look up at the ceiling. And the first thought that would come to my head is, oh, no, I'm a drunk again. And I can't stop. 
and um, and I thought it would be easy to stop when I needed to stop and I knew I needed to stop and the years were flying by and I couldn't stop. And then the damage that you know happens when you're active alcoholic started to happen and then my wife, ex-wife now, uh, decided that you know this is this is it you know we're going to break up. So that happened and um, I had four kids as I say I had a couple of houses and she moved into one of the houses uh, that I had and um, and I stayed in the house that was the family home you know it was financially that was the solution at the time it had a mortgage I was working and um, you know and we, she was we were decorating the, the new house or the, the, the rented house for it to move into it and that went on for months and we used to talk and chat and laugh and I'd be over there painting it and decorating and you know and she's saying you know it's, it's getting almost finished now I, I'll, be, I'll be moving soon and I'd say oh yeah okay 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 um, so sort of part of me didn't want to believe it was happening part of me just was just blanked out the reality of this situation and then one Friday I came home and they were gone. Do you know what I mean? Like the four kids, the kids weren't gone far, but the house was just empty and they were gone. And, uh, and all the photographs were still on the wall. And I went up to one of the kids' bedrooms and they had this, you know, I sat down on the edge of one of their beds, this Ryan Giggs duvet or something. Take that duvet or something. 